thanks for tuning in here, uh, watching us in this uh, different uh, circumstances here that's caused us to be apart for this week and the next week. We are trying to record the service, get that out ahead of time so that you can watch this at your uh, own time and then we can get some physical copies and that sort of thing of this service to those uh, that would need those. So please bear with us uh, today as we do a first run through of this. Hopefully we won't need to do this for much longer, but I, this is where we are at today. Uh, so you can follow along. There's an order of service probably right next to or in a link with this video. You can open that up and follow along. Uh, we'll begin our worship with a call to worship as we hear this. I, as we'll share Psalm 46 as our call to worship this morning. God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And so again. Last, a couple of pages there with uh, some announcements and 
uh, specifically highlighting ways that we can stay connected to each other over these next couple of weeks where we'll uh, not be meeting together in person. Lots of different ways you can do that through Facebook especially, uh, Facebook Live, different videos and uh, daily devotions being offered that way. Uh, Mom's virtual gathering group has been meeting. You can talk to Cassie about that. We have Sunday school resources available for you to use at home. Uh, and uh, a few other ways, uh, too, that you'll see there in your, your bulletin. Uh, World Mission Prayer League is having a 24-hour day of prayer. You can talk to Roxana, call her uh, to sign up to, for a half an hour prayer slot. You can sign your name there to pray for missionaries and the sending of God's word around the world. Uh, one other thing that is still going to be taking place is uh, this Wednesday, uh, March 25th. We'll continue with uh, church pictures because there's only one family at a time. And it's easy enough to keep our distance that way. Uh, so. If you've signed up for Wednesday, March 25th, to take your picture, uh, still come. And if you don't feel comfortable doing that, call the church office and leave a message there. And uh, we'll make other arrangements for you. And just a note, I plan to be in the office most mornings next week. So you can give me a call or call on my cell phone, be in touch. And be sure to reach out to uh, connect with friends, family, uh, with our church family during this time. And so we'll uh, continue our worship with uh, coming before our God, confessing our, our sins, receiving his forgiveness, his words of life once again. And we gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in whom we have life and forgiveness. I'd invite you just to pause in confession before our Lord this morning. And I invite you to pray with me. Merciful Father, I know that you have died for me and have forgiven all my sins. I confess I have not always loved, trusted, and followed you with my whole heart. I also confess that I have not cared for my neighbor as I ought. For the sake of your Son, renew my life and life by the power of your Holy Spirit so I may live, serve, and honor you in all that I do. So we were reminded again of the good news of Jesus, that all who, who have believed and trusted in his gift of life and grace, that indeed our sins are forgiven, and he's given us the power of his Holy Spirit, that we would walk in the newness, the, the forgiveness of sins. It's in his, in his holy name. Amen. I invite you to pray with me too now. Our prayer of the day is printed in your, your order of worship. God of all mercy, by your power to heal and to forgive, graciously cleanse us from all sin and make us strong through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Testament reading for uh, this the fourth Sunday in Lent comes from Isaiah chapter 42. For a long time I have held my peace, I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor, I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame. Those who, they are turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my master, or messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but does not observe them. His eyes are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness' sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. And then our gospel reading for our, our gathering today comes from John chapter 9. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. But Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is still day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with his saliva. And then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. He, was, he went and washed and came back, seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. And others said, No, but he is like him. But he kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your, your eyes opened? And the man answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. So they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes, so the Pharisees asked him again how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight, until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, Ask him, he is of age. And so for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner I do not know. But one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. 
They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God had spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opens my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could, not, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us. And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast the man out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to them, and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. Here is a gospel reading and I invite you to confess with me our, our uh, faith in our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We use these ancient words that the Church has spoken together, the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, in the life everlasting. Amen. Yeah.
our New Testament reading and our sermon text for today uh, comes from Romans chapter 12, where we hear these words, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of it, of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, in service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Here ends the reading today. We'll turn now to open God's word for our As we turn to open God's word this morning, I invite you to quiet your hearts and your minds with me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity we can be together with you, even though we are apart. We know we trust that your spirit is alive. He's moving and stirring in our hearts, in your church, and in this world. Open our eyes to see you once again, Lord Jesus. Send out your Holy Spirit to stir in our hearts, to open us to your word, your life-giving, your life-transforming word. It's in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. And so again, our text as you saw already, as you heard, is uh, Romans chapter 12. We've been looking at Trinity here uh, during the season of Lent. We've been working with this idea of gospel identity and gospel living. What it means for us to have our identity, who we are, rooted and grounded in Jesus and the hope, the truth of the gospel and how that identity shapes how we live. It's the idea that who we are trickles down and, and flows through all of life, and our actions, our very lives, are shaped by who we are. And specifically today, as, as you saw at the beginning of, of the service, you'll see in your order of service, I want us to, to start thinking about how we can be the church scattered. What it looks like to be the church scattered. God willing, this, uh, this time apart from each other is, is just a short time, uh, just a couple of weeks, but we don't know. Things change, have been changing so quickly that it's hard to get a handle on what to expect, even for today. But I want us to think, especially in light of, of this passage here in Romans 12, what it means for us to be the church scattered, what it means for, for you, for you and for me, to be the church, even though we can't be together physically. Paul here calls us, invites us to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. Now, I've been thinking a lot about sacrifice uh, this 
past couple of weeks because really we're in a time unlike that which we've seen for generations. A time where the government has implemented emergency orders, those orders which basically would allow the government to come and use anything at their disposal. We're living at a time where, for the first time in many, many years, we might be facing the shortage of food. Toilet paper is the, the famous example. We're living at a time where the government has made requests that we limit our social contact. Has put a limit on the size of gatherings. I've been thinking a lot this week in light of all those things of this idea of sacrifice. What it means to sacrifice. And while these days are difficult, they're hard, especially as many of us face the, the prospect of loss of employment, loss of, of retirement funds as we watch the stock, stock market lose much of its value. While these are difficult times, my mind has been drawn back to history to the people of this, this nation and many others who sacrificed so that we would enjoy the life we do here in Canada. You think back to the sacrifices people made in wars, especially the world wars, how men and women laid down their lives for the freedoms that we enjoy. How goods and services were rationed in aid of the war effort. I think to the, uh, to the 1930s, uh, the Dust Bowl, the, the depression, the scarcity of food, of resources. A scarcity was a way of life. And then we look to what we're facing today. And while we may be inconvenienced and, and may be called to sacrifice to give up some things, we're reminded that so many others have laid down so much more for us. And really that's the idea of us being living sacrifices. You know, a sacrifice is something uh, given in place or in benefit of someone else. That's the idea of us being living sacrifices. It's rooted, it's grounded in the fact that someone has given so much more than you and I ever will be demanded to give. Verse 1 of Romans 12 again says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Some other translations say that I, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, in light of God's mercy, to present your bodies as living sacrifice. The key phrase for this whole passage really rests in that idea of the mercies of God because it draws us back and reminds us of the one who has made the greatest sacrifice for you, for me, for the whole world. Reminds us of the mercy of God in sending his son Jesus to die on the cross, to lay down his life, to give his life that you and I and the whole world might benefit. That we can trust and believe in the good gift of Jesus and we would have life. So in this time of, of sacrifice, we're called to put it in perspective. The things that we are requested to lay down, maybe forced to lay down, to give up for the benefit of others in the name of public health, public safety. We do so in light of the one who laid 
down it all, who gave his very life, who didn't hold anything back, in view of God's mercy, in view of what God has done, we are called to be living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. And he says this is our spiritual worship. You know, one of the, the hardest things about this time is that at a time when we need spiritual life and nourishment and encouragement more than ever before, we can't come together and worship physically. One of the very heart, the, the heart of the Christian life, the Christian faith together, we can't do. We're having to adjust and do things like this, take time in our own homes for worship. But Paul reminds us that our, our act of worship is to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And so I want us to think, even as we, we wrestle with this idea of what it means to be the church scattered, what it means to be the church where we are, as we think about that, I want us to realize that even though we can't worship together physically, our very lives are to be an act of worship. Our very lives can be an act of worship. It says this happens in, in a number of ways. It doesn't happen naturally. We don't naturally seek the benefit, the, be the best of others. We don't naturally look to God for our, our help. We saw that in the early days of this uh, pandemic being announced and starting to spread in Canada when Every, when many people rushed to the stores and, and hoarded, stocked up on things that they thought they might need, which often left those in a vulnerable position, weak, exposed. Many people sought the benefit of themselves and not that of those around them. Just a small example of, of how sin still infects each and every one of us. Because sin is simply that, that, that idea that I'm more important than anyone else. I know better than anyone else. I know better than God himself even. So how do we offer our bodies as living sacrifices? Again, it's not something we do naturally, but, but it comes from the the power of the Holy Spirit living, working in us. Paul uses a, a contrasting image. First he says, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. This idea of conforming I've, I've always thought of in terms of a jello mold. You know how you can pour the jello into the mold? You can let it sit in the fridge for a few hours, it'll firm, it'll set. Can take it out and move the mold, and then the jello looks like that shape. I've long thought of, of our lives in contrast to the world like that. How Paul says, don't set into the shape, into the pattern of the world. The pattern of the world, which we see you know, to, in these days, is, is one of fear, one of anxiety. You turn on the news and you hear the, the level of, of worry, the level of panic, the level of anxiety. Paul says, don't be conformed to that. Don't be conformed. Don't take the shape of, of the world. Don't take the shape of, of the fear, the anxiety, the, the, the worry. Don't take the shape of what the world calls us to. And in normal times, normal days, you know, before this uh, crisis hit us, often that would look like the pressures of society being shaped by media, being shaped by, by sports, by school, by friends, by work. So much outside influence wanting to shape us, wanting to make us look like they think we should look. But increasingly, in, in these past few days, I've been thinking of this idea of conforming to the pattern of the world almost more like a vice. 
You know, if you've done work with metal or that sort of thing, you know that metal in itself doesn't bend very easily, but you put it in a vise and it can rather easily, quickly bend, be shaped into whatever angle, whatever shape you want it to be. Because it's under pressure too that we can be conformed. It's under pressure that we can be conformed. Call to resist that. Not be shaped by those outside influences. Not be shaped by what the world says we should do, how the world says we should think. Instead, Paul says, but be transformed. In verse 2 here, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This word transformation, we've talked about it a little bit because this has been our Bible verse that we've been. Uh, learning at Trinity this, this month, uh, Romans 12, verse 2, do not conform uh, to the patterns of this world, but be transformed like a butterfly by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This word transformed is the same uh, word metamorphosis that we use for, for caterpillars turning into butterflies. And it, it implies not just an external change, but a fundamental internal character change. For too long, I think the church has made the, the Christian life about that external change. You have to get your life together. You have to, to make it look good. Whether, whether that's been the explicit message or that's kind of been the implied understanding. We're reminded that's not what the Christian life primarily is about. For those of you who do a, a work on cars and that sort of thing, it would be like buying an antique car, wanting to restore it, and you only do the body work. You only fix it up, give it a, a, a coat of paint, you take out the dents and smooth it down. It looks nice on the outside, but if you didn't touch, clean the engines, the, the internal components, it's not going to run well. See, laying, giving our lives as living sacrifices isn't just about doing some body work, some exterior renovation. It's about a renovation of the heart, a renovation of our mind. It's a call to have our minds transformed by the Spirit of God. By the Spirit of God. This verse goes on to say that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. His good and acceptable and perfect will. You can test, you can approve what is God's will. And many of us, I think, need that in these days. Seeking, looking, asking, God, where are you? Where are you in the midst of this? What are you doing? What are you doing in, in my life, even? This idea of testing the will of God, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Really, the sense here of, of testing is that of approving, knowing for sure the will of God is good, perfect, holy, and acceptable. I think of it kind of in terms of a certificate of authenticity. If you do any sort of sports memorabilia or collectibles or that sort of thing, uh, often you'll get a certificate of authenticity saying that this item is the real deal. You can trust that it is what you bought. Paul says our lives can reflect that. Now we can trust that God's will is good, that God's will is, is acceptable and perfect. The word perfect meaning nothing wrong with it, first of all, but also that God's will will be done. God's will will be completed in the end. That nothing can stand against God. In days like today, we need to be reminded of that. 
that we can offer our bodies as living sacrifices. We can, we can lay down our, our rights, our freedoms, our privileges. We can seek the benefit, the well-being of others ahead of ourselves because we can trust in the very fact that God's will will be done. In light of God's mercy, in light of God sending His Son, God will do, God will accomplish all He has set out to do. And that's the rest of the reading really goes through that. You know, Paul says, whatever grace, whatever gifts you've been given, do it for the glory of God. He says, as, as in verse 4, as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. See, Paul says we don't exist for ourselves, just to look out for ourselves, but we exist for the glory of God, first of all, but we exist for each other, for the building up of the church, for the encouragement of one another. We exist so that the word of God, the hope of Jesus, God's perfect will, would be made known. And so in these days of learning to be the church scattered, these days of social isolation, social distancing, which is really foreign for us in small town Saskatchewan here, not being able to go down for coffee with our, with our coffee uh, row friends, and these days, as we think about how you can be the church, where you are, we're reminded of this invitation, of who we are in Christ, our gospel identity. And in view of God's mercy, of Jesus giving his life for you and for me, We can be living sacrifices. People who reach out to friends and neighbors, offer to, to do errands, run, run and buy things at the store for them. Those that can't leave their house or don't want to. We can be living sacrifices simply by picking up the phone, having a phone call with those that feel particularly isolated. We could be living sacrifices just by reaching out, connecting over, over a text, saying, hey, I'm thinking about you. Can I, how can I pray for you? We could be living sacrifices by living our lives in the trust and the hope that God's will will be done. That Jesus is our Lord, our Savior, that we need not fear, we need not be conformed to the pattern of the world, but in the confidence that our minds, our hearts, our lives are being transformed by the Holy Spirit to the honor and glory of Jesus' name. So now may they receive the, the benediction God sending, making us his, his people, sending us out with his power, with his grace, with his favor. We hear these uh, ancient words from Numbers chapter 6. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look on us with favor and give us his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sing our last song.
joining us uh, for worship a little bit different this week and uh, next week. Uh, but still, we, we join in the same spirit of, of the living God, the God who's with us, the God that's uh, watching over us, provides for us through all things. Encourage you uh, this week to, to especially reach out to family, friends, those around you. Uh, send, send phone, uh, make some phone calls, send some texts, uh, just to check in on each other, uh, encourage each other uh, during this time of social distancing and isolation. Where we go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.